The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Today let's talk about a movie that's kind of short circuit meets Top Gun with just a dash of Terminator and a splash of Knight Rider. That's right, it's stealth. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. And we are here today to talk about the I, Josh Lucas vehicle, <laughs> I guess. Stealth. So, basic plot of this movie. It is uh, your typical buddy film <laughs> set in the near future. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's completely your... It's like Tango and Cash. It's a, it's a formula, exact formula. We have three... Super pilots in Jessica Biel, Jamie Foxx, and Josh Lucas. And the super pilots get a new addition to their team, which they are very skeptical about. The new addition is, of course, Johnny Five. I mean, Eddie. Or the UDAC. Or this thing has, like, eight goddamn names, which yeah. really helps cement it as a character, I thought. It helps. It is a plane that can fly itself. It's an intelligent... It has... And artificial intelligence, then it gets zapped by lightning and kind of turns evil and they have to take it down. That's what the trailer promised us. It's really, like, more than that. Not, like, deeper more than that, but it just kind of keeps going. Like, that was the one-hour mark. Yeah, and that's the basic plot, right? I mean, Marisha, do you have anything else that you would add there? I mean, you're, you're right, though. It goes on. Like, they have to keep telling the story, and it doesn't always seem like they have a lot of story to tell, so they have to make up military betrayal in there like in the military hierarchy or something but yeah that's about it romance betrayal uh, grief all the big exciting words yes. uh, let's let's talk about our what the fuck moments i will start uh, there i there are only a few here because it's just it's more that the <laughs> more that the conceit of the movie about the evil intelligent plane that's the big what the fuck moment in and of itself but in the actual uh, script not not as many so my first what the fuck moment the fact that someone refers to how many terabits the plane can hold oh, terabits as opposed to terabytes right right twice in this movie we have to hear an adult say that they have to go pee pee another favorite mo line of mine pardon my c cup so, yeah, the I gotta go pee pee line. That was when it first happened, I was like, what the fuck? And then they put a lampshade on it later, and that's why Jessica Biel says it later to mock the person earlier. But I don't think it's exactly fair to mock somebody in your script when you just give them a line that doesn't make any and, sense. And it's their only line in the entire movie anyway. I honestly thought, because of the way they were playing that scene, because the person who says it the first time is a woman who, I believe it's Josh Lucas, is trying to bed for the night. And the way that they played it, where she's trying to get the other woman to go to the bathroom with her, I thought that they were like spies, and they were going to be taking shit from Josh Lucas and Jamie Foxx. Oh, yeah, and then, that yeah, that that certainly didn't happen. Yeah, that just kind of fizzled out. But overall, man, all these, the, the two guys who keep kind of getting women, they are so happy to divulge classified information to any civilian chick who comes along if they think it might help them score. And some of their, I mean, their habits with women, or at least, uh, the, so there's the one pilot, Henry, I noticed that there was this strange thing he had where at the, in that scene where they're, both trying to bed women he talks about how he wants women to bow down before him and then later on they're in thailand for actually no reason and he randomly seduces this taiwanese woman who can't really understand what he's saying but holds his umbrella for him and like takes him to bed anyway and it's just this strange strange interaction with with the women that they're sort of kind of dating not really and then we find out from josh lucas that henry is He's very dedicated to getting flowers to the women he sleeps with the next morning. So it's, I guess Henry had a, a very light side about his casual sex I suppose so. with random people who didn't understand English. That whole, I, you know, so that frustrated me. I mean, so 
I guess the way to approach this is very much through the characters because they're about four in the entire film and they're, you know, it's it's just kind of a, an easy in. We have Ben Gannon, who is played by Josh Lucas, and I, I really wanted his nickname to be Ben Loose Cannon Gannon. <laughs> But that's never brought up, and I was like, how do you name a Top Gun, plays by his own rules character Ganon, and never call him Loose Cannon Ganon? I guess you should have written for the show. They needed me as a, what's that called, you know, a script, um, uh, no, hell, what, what Josh, Josh Whedon used to do, and I guess does now for Marvel. But I was frustrated by Henry, who's, who's Jamie Foxx. Um, Henry... It is of course, of course, he dies because we have the Josh Lucas Jessica Beale romance, and you can't kill all the romantic leads, right? right? And so, you know, I knew from like five minutes in, man, Jamie Fox is biting the dust here. But it's like he has no character except that, like, he likes to fuck and fly. That's it. That's the only thing we know and about him. And he really right? has a thing for prime numbers. Yes, that's true, that's true. But then at the end, Josh Lucas is saying that too, and it could be in memory of Henry, or it could be that he's the one who started him on it. We really don't know. It's just there was nothing there to care about really any of the characters. I kind of like Jessica Biel just because she seemed to be in her own little universe most of the time. <laughs> Like, I love that she wears a push-up bra on missions. I thought that was an odd choice. Hmm. I didn't even notice and... that. <laughs> yeah, she's, like, stranded in North Korea or South Korea, whichever the bad one is, for, North. like, the second half of the film. And, man, her breasts are perky the entire <laughs> time she's running from the military. And uh, And then, of course, she wears that, like, those mesh pants that cling to her ass like a like a jealous lover okay so we all know who you were looking at through this entire movie <laughs> it was josh lucas's eyes let me tell you <laughs> like a freshly chlorinated pool <laughs> just fall right into him and jessica beale's like entire like her having to carry that whole scene where she's falling with a parachute and debris is coming around her and it felt as if like the people writing the script didn't know if they would have the budget to show any of this so they literally have her narrate every single thing that happens to her and what i noticed was the visual effects in there because she says her parachute's on fire and then the entire parachute like evaporates like really really fast and i was thinking they didn't make this out of like fire like repellent material you you would think but no apparently not that that was not in the budget overall i i you know, the thing that shocked me the most about this movie is I've been wanting to riff this movie or talk about this movie or do something with this movie for years now because I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, Jesus. I mean, this to me looks so much like a like a late 80s sort of movie, you know, around that short circuit Terminator sort of craze dipping into this well of like, you know, what if machines gain sentience and then they're evil and now that's having a resurgence in this whole... what. What's that thing called? The divide or the, uh, uh, you know, that, that point at which machines achieve an intelligence where they're indecipherable from human reactions. But in any case, it really felt like a cheesy 80s movie to me. And then I watched it and I was amazed at, I mean, this thing had a budget. This was like a big budget movie. I noticed the special effects were really quite good. Like there were, there were so many different, I mean, it was a fighter jet movie. So there were lots of fighter jet scenes and they were all, I mean, they were all pretty exciting. I, I liked it. I, we got to see every inch of the inside of a fighter jet plane because like it would constantly be like somebody would hit a missile launch and the camera would shoot into the joystick and go down through and you'd see all these interconnecting wires and you'd come out at the missile bay and follow the missile down and it i mean i didn't need all of that but <laughs> <laughs> but it was pretty cool to look at and it must have taken a long time and there are explosions that are are just beyond humanly possible, I would assume, unless you're using, like, a mini nuke. At one point, he's like, we gotta take out that tree line, shoots one missile and an entire tree line, like, like a cityscape-sized tree line just bursts into flame, and it's like, dear God, do we really have missiles that can do... I guess this is the near future. I guess so. Not to mention all these precision right. strikes, though, that, like, don't seem possible. Like, at one point, they're... They're near Pakistan, I guess, and they they fire a missile like straight into. Was that where it was? And they strike like fire it straight into the bunker that like 
goes straight through, like, down into the mountain, like, as far as it could possibly go before exploding. Yeah, and into into a room with shop store dummies in it. Oh, yeah. So, wait, where was that at? I don't know. That was in Nevada. Oh. Yeah, that was at the test site in Nevada where they were simulating uh, the Middle East or whatever. Okay. We were supposed to be faked out. And, uh, I mean, I guess that was clever. It's, you know, it's it's the people who notice it are like, oh, this is Nevada doubling for the Middle East. And then it's like, haha, got you. It's actually Nevada doubling as Nevada. And uh, uh, there's also the explosion at, like, the, the base or whatever it is that takes out, like, seven vehicles and 30 people. And... And it's just, it was like, holy hell, this must have played amazingly on the big screen. And I find it weird. I'm like, you know, nobody I know knows this movie. This was just kind of a forgotten straight-to-video, if you will, sort of film. I mean, it, it just, it didn't go anywhere or do very well. And I, I, I don't know why. I mean, you look at this versus, say, Transformers. This is just an objectively better movie, which is... Yeah. kind of sad because it's not very good but it's still an objectively better movie and it's like wh why why didn't this do well you yeah. know yeah i'm not sure like i i did think it was pretty decent yeah and it's 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 definitely got the budget so the weirdest thing to me and i guess let's let's talk about this is that you watch the trailer and it's like Eddie or Budak or whatever the fuck you want to call it, the plane, gets zapped by lightning and then he goes evil and starts, you know, possibly killing civilians. That's what the trailer makes it look like. And there is that fear for a little bit, but essentially very quickly you find that the, the lightning strike is more of, I think it's meant to be the, the monolith, the obelisk or whatever in 2001 <laughs> that makes him kind of grow up very quickly. Yeah, I noticed that because they, well, first of all, I thought it was weird that, I mean, just like in making sense in the show, like they, like for a fighter jet to get struck by lightning, I don't even know if that's possible because don't you need a ground to, to have a lightning strike or, or something? But first of all, they, did, they didn't design it to be hit by lightning, but they did, they said, design it to evolve. But then it didn't evolve until it got hit by lightning. So what were they expecting to happen? I, I guess they were just expecting its, like, uh, reflexes to get better, stuff like that. Which, by the way, the whole, like, I love... <laughs> I always love whenever there's coding in movie because <laughs> I, I don't do a lot of coding, but I've messed around with it a little bit. And I love how everything now looks like the Matrix because it's, you know, the guys, like, looking at the code. They're kind of Steve Jobs characters looking at the code and it's like this, like weird three D yeah. hieroglyphs. And I noticed shit. that they were looking at the code, and it was like completely unreadable because it was all these lines on top of each other. How are you supposed to read that? But I guess <laughs> somehow. And then, and then, like <laughs> to take care of the code, he enters in like delete high functions dot <laughs> exe, <Yeah. laughs> which was awesome. And and the the. They have to go chase down Eddie when he's gone bad, or no, this is before they chase him down. There's a scene where Josh Lucas, who's kind of playing a Matthew McConaughey Jr. in this movie, I think. I think that's what he was going for. You know, he had that, eh, I got kind of a slow southern charm to me and piercing blue eyes. And, yeah. You know, I, I did... He goes down into Rangoon, and he does this thing where, you know, it's like, no human pilot can do it. There's a 73% chance you're going to black out. And he's like, you know, fuck you, I'm loose cannon Ganon. <laughs> and he dives down and then is going through the streets of Rangoon for approximately 20 seconds. And I'm like, man, Rangoon must have the straightest fucking streets ever. He also blacked out. Not during the high dive, of course, but while he was going through the streets. So, yeah, I mean, that was a stroke of luck. He was really, really lucky, which I think is what they decide at the end, that they're really lucky, right? I, well, yeah, I think so. Although the ending, I was, I was pretty dissatisfied with because, I don't know, if you look at the course of events and then you look at the ending, like, what was the point of the story? Uh, yeah, nobody's... Cause Sam Shepard's dead, and that, and Henry's dead, and that's about yeah, it. Yeah, the um, and, and the and the plane. I yeah, I I guess though I got a very Terminator feel that they were like they showed you big parts exploding out of it so that you could think that oh he could be salvaged uh, or whatever. Yeah, perhaps, right? perhaps so. Yeah, and I also thought it was weird because through the film 
there's this line that Josh Lucas gets where he's like, you know, or maybe it's Henry says it to him and he just agrees where it's like, you know, Jessica Biel is, she's set to go all the way, right? She's like perfect Navy material. She's perfect material for X, Y, and Z. And then at the end, Josh Lucas disobeys like his 17th direct order. And, and there's the whole thing that like they can't say I love you because they're both in the Navy, right? right. And, and so I thought the ending was going to be he's kicked out, but you know, like, honorably discharged or whatever it is for the Navy, and they can finally have their love story. And instead, they just laugh on the pier of the boat. And she calls him a pussy. <laughs> and that's the end yeah, of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I actually rewound because I couldn't hear that damn line because so many times the music was much louder than any of the lines that people got. Like, for instance, I believe... Eddie's last uh, words, right before he dies, his last word is blee blah. Oh, I I thought it was goodbye. Maybe it's goodbye, but what I heard was blee blah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I was I was like, did Eddie just go crazy? I don't I don't understand. Mm. I also didn't really understand why Eddie was like, oh, I have to ram this stupid little helicopter rather than say, shoot it. I, I think he was like dying already. And so he decided to just take it out that way or something. Let's see. Talking about the action sequences, let's just a few more action sequence craziness things. This movie sure likes planes. That was my first note, I think. It what? Planes? <laughs> it sure likes planes. Oh, right. We get to see a lot of plane actions. There's this opening action sequence. It's the... Uh, Nevada freakout sequence where that just goes on forever and we don't know any of the characters yet and I'm like I don't I don't know why I should care about any of this and I was really unsure why that was in there I was unsure about that kind of stuff but also like what happened in Alaska like there's a little bit like I guess they felt the need to introduce some more plot because they couldn't wrap up the story or whatever. So they throw in this really, really rushed, like it's, it's the scenes necess aren't necessarily rushed, but the, the story of it is like, if you look at the entire movie as a whole, and then look at the part that is about these pilots commanding officer betraying them, essentially, like that happens really quickly and all of a sudden, and they don't explain it very well, but he, he basically tries to get his subordinates killed in Alaska because he didn't want to get in trouble for the plane, I think? I'm not entirely sure. It just wasn't at all clear. Yeah, that, it, it's it's Sam Shepard, which, oh my god, with his hair shaved, I did not recognize him at all. It's Sam she Shepard playing the evil lieutenant or whatever the hell he is, and I was like, he's so likable for the first half that I don't buy him, like, going to the dark side in the second half. Yeah. And and it's like, yeah, that whole, his arc was ridiculously rushed, almost happened off screen. The only, like, foreshadowing we got for it that I noticed was right at about the halfway point, he's eating an apple when he's talking about, like, he's going to break the rules. And I was like, seriously, they threw in a fucking original sin foreshadowing piece? <laughs> Because I, I, I actually made a note of it, and I was like, eating the apple, is he, this is symbolic. And But then it was, it seriously was. That's like the point in the movie where he decides, you know, even though this entire film I've been like, hey, you know, if we fuck up, we fuck up, whatever. I mean, you know, what's important is human lives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly he's like... Josh Lucas knows too much. I'm going to have him killed in the in, in Alaska. With an injection from the doctor who who was quite shady, I, I will say, like from the very beginning, he was he was trying to inject him with this huge syringe full of antibiotics, like this gigantic <laughs> amount of fluid. <laughs> right, which he pulls from a bottle labeled serum. <laughs> which... <laughs> I wasn't even sure, I, like, when Lucas is fighting me off, I was like, I don't even know if this is good or bad, like, I do, because it just said serum, it could be <laughs> right. sleepy serum, right? It, it yeah. could be fine. Yeah. So back to the, the action scenes, I think my favorite is where our guys commit a 9-11, this is the Rangoon piece. Mm where uh, he drops a bomb into this building going straight down. The bomb goes to the bottom of the building, explodes to the point that the entire building, this is like a full-on 9-11 strike on this place, the entire building goes down, takes out streets all around it. We see multiple people in the streets beforehand, like tons of people 
where the fucking plane is reading fingerprints off of light poles. I mean, this is, you know, so ridiculous. And then afterwards, they're like, collateral damage? Zero. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, do these guys not understand what collateral damage means? I guess not. (laughs) Did you notice that everyone in this military disobeys orders and then it's totally fine? Yeah, nobody gets upbraided, like, beyond a, like... Well, <laughs> I mean, no, seriously, nobody gets upgraded like at all. Yeah, it's like th- even they're like a dysfunctional family. Even when uh, Ben Gannon does his, like, he even expects to get in trouble for disobeying orders. His superior officer is like, "No, no, no, I'm not mad at you for that. I'm mad at you for this other thing." And then he's fine at the end. He's still in the navy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, after possibly like starting a war with North Korea, we never exactly figure out how that turns <laughs> out. Yeah, I guess there are no witnesses, so nobody knows what happened. Yeah. My whole thought on that was, don't you? I would assume that DMZ is better guarded. The fact that Jessica Beale, like shooting with her arm over a tiny stone fence, was able to take out most of the battlements. Yeah, <laughs> maybe she's just that badass. She really is. She. She kind of had her own Rambo 3 storyline all of its own going on there. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that, like... So so there are certain characters that interact with the plane, and I was actually... I mean, I was kind of hoping that her story and the plane's story would intersect a little bit more, but instead, all that happens, like, in terms of characters is that Ben Gannon tries to get into a pissing match with, with the plane because he, like, they even talk about it, too. He doesn't want the plane to be better than he is. And, um... Yeah. But at the at the very beginning, I I, I made this note of, of how um, the plane had Chekhov's cockpit because you see, like, the, the plane is unmanned but there's but there's a space for it, which means that someone is going to end up flying, flying in the plane and it ended up being his former enemy, Ben Gannon. It turns into a buddy movie in the last bit. Like, Josh Lucas is giggling at his jokes. This guy who killed his best friend, he's like, ha it's funny, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Which was uncomfortable, to say the least. Yeah, it had some interesting emotional narratives there. Did you notice that after Henry dies, after, like, his... T- this is a very close-knit team of three... Henry s- slams into this cliff and is just absolutely like demolished. Like there's nothing left of him, and they're all recovering in shock. And his superior officer over the radio is like, "Shake it off." <laughs> that's right. Grieve later. You don't got time to grieve. I mean, he doesn't say that, yeah. but I, I, that's what I was thinking. And that slow mo shot of Henry's plane being destroyed. I really want to hope that they filmed an actual model in slow motion being thrown against a little mountain set (laughs) because that was so over the top and ridiculous. And what I thought was weirder was Henry's death is they slow it down for a little bit, but then Eddie's death at the end, it slows down, there's massive explosions, and like a spiritual hymn starts playing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like Eddie's death was a bigger moment than Henry's but, death, which seems. I, I guess I mean it's interesting though. There were parallels though, because they both die by running into something and then exploding. So that might have been an interesting parallel there. Maybe that's what they were going for. The one other thing I want to say about an action scene is when Ben Loose Cannon Gannon escapes from the place in Alaska in Eddie's cockpit. He comes back around because there's this one guy still shooting after. I don't understand how he survived after that explosion that took out, like, a city block. And there's one guy still shooting, and he comes back, targets him, and goes, Welcome to Alaska, and then shoots him. (laughs) And I was like, wait, was this entire movie one big ad for Alaska? Because it's a terrible tourism ad for Alaska. (laughs) It's not even clear whether these the people that were there were part of the U.S. military or not. Like, I, I got a very distinct impression that they weren't. But I, I have no idea who they were. They were just buddies of Sam Shepard's. Yeah, who, I guess He so. was like, <laughs> who like, he gave them a story saying that they were like terrorists or something. And so they didn't know any better. They were just trying to help out their friend. They were, although I, I guess we were, the, the reason we know that they were evil is because they had like a bed 
with manacles on it hooked up to batteries. Oh. And the thing about that, because remember one guy dies by being thrown onto it and getting electrocuted? I, I must have missed that. Yeah, and, and the thing that really upset me about that was during the big firefight where, like, literally Josh Lucas or Ben Luce Cannon Gannon just, like, jumps up and starts shooting at everybody, and nobody can shoot him, but he gets everybody else just literally out in the middle of this floor in a warehouse, and he shoots one guy so that he falls back onto the bed and is immediately electrified. And I'm like, if you have a bed that you use for electrical torture, don't keep it on at all <laughs> times. Why would you do that? That is a safety hazard, like a huge safety but hazard. But it's also a safety hazard to label your poison as serum, so... <laughs> It should have just had a big skull and crossbones on yeah. it. Yeah. I guess Sam Shepard just knew, like, this evil base, and that's that's how he was just like, hey, evil base, can I send some guys over there? Let's talk about the shifting morality, because I think this is the thing that confused me the most about this movie, was at the beginning, we get Loose Cannon's got this whole spiel about why he doesn't trust uh, Eddie, and it's that uh, if war keeps getting more mechanized and more uh, dehumanized, or not dehumanized is the wrong word, but if humans keep being divorced from it more and more, then war turns into a video game and we don't take it seriously. We have to understand the human cost, which is certainly a deep-sounding sentiment, but I gotta say, I don't think I have ever seen a movie that felt more like a video game to me <laughs> than this movie. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that. Although, I, th I, th I mean, I thought it was cool that they brought that up and played with it a little bit. I actually, I mean, honestly, I was, the entire movie, I, I was just rooting for the plane, and I was really interesting to see where he was gonna go, because he never got to, like, he got, to, he got struck by lightning, he started, you know disobeying orders he started getting this huge complex like oh eddie eddie's gonna eddie's the thing this is this is what we're going for here so he start he's g like basically gonna go do all these military maneuvers by himself and we just never get to see any of those ben gannon like chases him down and stops him before he can even like they get they get into like russian airspace and get shot at by russians and then that's as far as they get before the plane's story i mean essentially ends I mean, I guess the plane's arc is it grows up, right? It starts as a child, it wants to show off, and then it gets hit by lightning, which gives it a double helix in its code. That I love that bit where it shows the lightning strike and it gets a double helix. And then it, it becomes a surly, rebellious teenager for a while. And then at the end, it's like, oh, I get it now. I get why murdering people is bad. And I'm going to stick with you, Ben Gannon, because you know what's up. I, I think that was the, the arc of the plane, and then it self-sacrifices itself, which, you know, any self-aware robot has to do in these yeah, movies, Yeah, I guess right? that's, that's it, something that has to be done. And and so the plane actually had this insane arc, but yeah, I did, I, I myself was also wanting it to go farther. I wanted to see, like, a Squadron Supreme plot with the plane. I wanted it to, like instigate martial law throughout the world <laughs> and destroy all nuclear weapons and be like you will now be happy <laughs> under me and hey you do that voice pretty well <laughs> and it, it, it and we don't get that we don't get anything like that we just get it fucking around in russia until the russians start shooting at it and even if the russians didn't start shooting at it it was going through with a, a tactical war game there was nothing there anyway so, like, if the Russians hadn't started shooting at it, it just would have shot down a rock or whatever. Well, it had it had this, like, a scenario in its mind that it they, they kept telling it wasn't real for some reason. I, I don't know. It was kind of a strange... Like, whatever it was, we'll never know because we never... They, ne they just never covered it. And speaking of that point, the uh, Steve Jobs character is looking through the code and he's like... He's obsessed with this caviar sweet meat or whatever it was called. And he's like, do you know what that is? And Sam Shepard's like, yeah, it's a, a war game or whatever. And then he's like, well, he thinks it's real and he's going to be there in 40 minutes. And I'm like, what sort of real time code download is Eddie allowing you to have, for God's <laughs> sake? Did you notice the one random F-bomb? I thought that was a little strange. It felt like a really solid PG, maybe even a PG-13, but basically PG action movie to me, and s suddenly someone says fuck, which you can still get away with PG-13, but it was just odd. What, what context was it in? I don't even remember. Yeah, it was so non-meaningful. It's the, the bad guys in Alaska trying to hurry Steve Jobs along, and he's like, I'm not fucking ready! <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And then, okay... 
talking about how nobody has any consequences in the military and talking about how bad they all are at their jobs, what about the fact that Joe Morton from Eureka, who's in this very briefly as, like, good guy from the Navy, a uh, good CO from the Navy, he goes and tells Sam Shepard, I'm arresting you for trying to assassinate your squad and just kind of being a douche, which is really weird because you're the nicest guy on the planet, and Sam Shepard's like, can you just give me two minutes alone? And he's like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, so is he going to kill himself or call in an evil strike? Because those are the only two things. I thought it was going to be the evil strike. Like, I I, I don't know, the suicide thing like ta caught me way off guard. Oh, I, I mean, it was, you know, it's, he's old school well so it, part of that though it. is because i just i didn't know what was going on with his character i didn't understand like it was i mean it wasn't explicitly stated very well that he that he was the one behind trying to trying to kill john gannon and everything so or ben ben, ben gannon ben. <laughs> <laughs> whatever his name is um <laughs> i love that we can't we can't just call him ben it has to be ben gannon or ben loose cannon again. <laughs> yeah Anyway, so so yeah, that the the character arc of that of that character just didn't didn't make sense. It was a little unclear. I really like that we got just a random Thailand break in here. We we just we just get to go visit Thailand for like no reason whatsoever. Even the characters we thought it was weird. They were like, "We just got here and you're going <laughs> to send us to Thailand for R&R." &R? <laughs> <laughs> or like we just had an action scene. Go go fucking visit some monks and shit. I think the thing that pissed me off the most about this movie was the fact that near the beginning of the movie, Jessica Biel has a great popsicle that is obviously pink. Oh, that great popsicle scene was so weird. Did you think it was weird because they were, like, fighting over the popsicle and it was just, like, cute? And I guess it was supposed to show the dynamic between the three of them and how close-knit they were and everything. But I don't know, with the popsicle thing with and the there were a couple of really strange childish moments. It was odd i think it was meant to show how much he cares for her that he was like there's one left you can have oh how sweet <laughs> but it's a fucking popsicle <laughs> yeah and then the other thing that annoyed me is that nobody else ate a popsicle even though they were all so excited about it it was like <laughs> if it ain't great fuck it dude <laughs> fuck that noise i'm not taking a fucking lemon popsicle what do you think i am like a fucking farmer you know it was just it was that was weird to me because it's like popsicles all pretty much just taste like ice <laughs> pretty much so yeah one last point that i wanted to bring up is, is simply that i i guess this you know so i looked up transformers that was 2007 apparently transformers i think was really the start of this era where big dumb movies are not only popular, but people realized, hey, we can sell these to other countries. And other countries realize and enjoy the fact that this is what America does best, is gigantic blockbuster hits where you don't need to speak the language to understand them. You just need to watch exciting explosions and laugh at the silly Americans, right? And, and Transformers really ushered that age in. And this was 2005, and I, this is the 10-year anniversary. Yay, stealth. And mm -hmm. so I, um, uh, we do a lot of anniversaries. It's odd. It's not, it's not intentional. But I really wonder if stealth had come in three years later, you know, if they had just kind of shelved it for three years and had it come out in 2008 post-Transformers, if it would have done a lot better. And who knows, maybe this movie did really well after foreign markets. But I, I would assume if it did, they would have done sequels I, I i don't know yeah but. i don't know and since i've never since i've never heard of it i i'm yeah i'm not really sure about that but you're right the timing might have been off for it because it because it was i mean it was decent it w certainly wasn't as bad as some of the other movies we've been watching that's that's for sure <laughs> so yeah let's take a look at this movie and say what one thing would you change to make it better what what one what would you do to the movie to make things to make it a, an instant classic well, oh, I don't know about instant classic, but I, I would have definitely <laughs> had Eddie like go forward with his with his tactical strike and like make that the the focal point of the movie because he was supposed to be the focal point of the movie and then and then wasn't for like the last half of it. So I could have definitely done with a lot more of his uh, evolution. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, nobody remembers. Ugh, God, I. I... Now I'm stuck. I, was it Steve Gutenberg in uh, Short Circuit? I think so. I, I don't know. 
But, you know, that that's the point. Nobody remembers Steve Gutenberg in Short Circuit. And in Short Circuit 2, they went ahead and they did a sequel with the, like, wacky Indian sidekick as the main character because they knew nobody is going to see these movies for the human people. They are here to see Johnny Five. That's mm-hmm. it. And that was a huge mistake in this movie. I, For me, yeah, I would have chopped out most of the first 30 minutes made these characters way more clearly defined and done the Squadron Supreme uh, slash Superman 4 Quest for Peace storyline where Eddie takes over the world and forces everyone into peace or else. Yeah, yeah. I I just, I like the idea of a a giant plain emperor (laughs) lording over, (laughs) lording over a cinder ash world, uh, if you will. That is a movie I would watch. All right, so... Uh, If you feel differently, have your own uh, thoughts and opinions, feel free to write us at info at iceonmars.net. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. This is Marisha Parker. I gotta go (laughs) pee-pee. You are funny. (laughs) Well, I try. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Thank <laughs> you.